Remember all the promise of the Arab Spring? Citizens had a voice and democracy would flourish. But alas, that is not what has been delivered in parts of the Middle East and North Africa, and of course in Syria in particular. Our next guest has spent three decades covering the region, and he joins us now for his perspective. Here's Robert Fisk, Middle East correspondent at The Independent, and we're very happy to have you in the studio again. Happy to be here. You yeah. were here a long time ago. It feels like it. Yeah, we're actually going to play a little snippet of your last visit here later on, but let's just mention off the top that we're grateful to Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East, which is the organization that you will be speaking at uh, later tonight. You're giving a lecture called Arab Awakening, But Are We Hearing the Truth? And I wonder if we can start by having you tell us what truth are you concerned that we are not hearing about this Arab awakening? Well, first of all, it is an Arab awakening. It's not an Arab Spring. <clears throat> Secondly, What's the I, difference? Um, because Arab Spring is a cliche, uh, sort of thing gets invented in Washington, um, not in Ottawa, of course. Uh, and I use the word Arab awakening because this was the title of George Antonius's book in 1938, where he first revealed the factual details of the Arab Revolution in 1916, when the Arabs agreed to fight on behalf of the Allies against the Ottoman Turks. And I think it is an intellectual awakening, as well as being a form of revolution. Anyway, spring became bloody summer in other places like Syria. So there's another good reason for avoiding um, you know, dates and uh, autumn became bloody, winter became bloody. Um, the truth you're not hearing, I think it's really that we, we pretended, we the West have pretended, this is all about democracy. I don't think it ever was. I think it's about dignity and I think it's about justice. But I never saw posters or banners saying, give us democracy. They said, down with the regime, get rid of Mubarak, get rid of Ben Ali. But they never said, give us democracy. And I think the reason was, and this is what we forget, that most of these dictators whom they were getting rid of have been supported by us. And we say that we're Democrats. So I think many Arabs are very suspicious of when the Western powers come and offer them democracy, when those same Western powers have spent decades propping up the dictators who've been repressing them. Well, we know what democracy looks like. If what they do want, we, well, do we, we know. Let me put it this way: we know in Canada what our democracy looks like. We well, do guess, indeed, don't I, we? I, yes. I, I guess in the states, your prime minister, not mine. <laughs> in the states, they know what their democracy looks like. If we don't know what democracy in the Middle East might look like, can you give us a sense about what kind of dignity and justice? they would like to see that they have not been experiencing? Well, I think they want dignity in the sense that um, their dictators, usually propped up by us, all of them at some stage, Saddam used to be our friend, Hafez al-Assad was, uh, so was Gaddafi at one point. Mr. Blair actually kissed him on both cheeks. Um, I think that all these dictators believed that they owned their own countries, that they actually possessed the real estate. And in many ways, what the people, I mean, I watched the Egyptian revolution from beginning to end, what the people of Egypt were saying was, this country belongs to us, it does not belong to that 84-year-old fool over there. And therefore what, though? It belongs to us and therefore what? Therefore, we have a right to decide how we live our lives, what the future of our country should be. But that's Albeit democracy, that just, it? well, is it? Is it really democracy? Self-determination for people? We get the right to decide how we'll be governed, what form of government? It's not quite what the Greeks were saying about democracy. And they did invent <laughs> the word, Steve. Okay. No, what they're looking for, what Arabs have looked for, is the freedom to speak, which is not necessarily the same as democracy. The freedom to say, our dictator is a corrupt old man, get rid of him, or a corrupt young man, in the case of other countries we can think of, like Syria. And I think what they've demanded is an end to being humiliated, humiliated by the West, humiliated by their dictators, who did all the humiliation for the West. Uh, peace treaties, which they may or may not believe in, and many of them in the case they don't believe in the peace treaty with Israel, although they're not going to break it because for all kinds of financial reasons they can't do that, and also because of common sense. Um, but I think that most Arabs whom I've come across, including Syria, and I've been on both sides of the front line, I've been with government troops, I've been on the other side, um, I think that in Syria, for example, even those people who are trying to crush the revolution, I'm talking about Assad, they say Syria will never be the same again. The old Syria is gone. We all know that now. And I think this came about because people not just use technology. We've spent too much time talking about how wonderful Twitter was and YouTubes and YTubes and so on. I think they were better educated. I think they traveled abroad. When I first went to Egypt. I hardly met anyone except the elite who'd ever been outside Egypt, unless they'd been to the Hajj and Mecca. Mm -hmm. And now they travel abroad. They see foreign television programs. They watch Al Jazeera. And they see that their country doesn't have to be the midden of corruption. 
that it was for so many decades. But if we look at all of them, they, they all seem to go in a particular direction, except for Syria, which has been the most Yemen, intractable. Yemen was pretty bad. Okay, but what? Well, Libya why was has, pretty bad. <laughs> but bad, but but over. They got rid of them. They eventually got rid of them pretty quickly. Why has Syria been the outlier in this? Well, first of all, because we're not going to use our military power in Syria. That's number one. So the war goes on for longer. Two is because we are encouraging all kinds of rebels in Syria, Islamists as well as being secular uh, army defectors. And three, I think, in the case of Syria, is that you see what you've got there are rich Arab states, which are Sunni, supporting a Sunni rebellion against an effectively Shiite minority government. So this is a sectarian war. And the sectarian wars are very ferocious. Everyone gets involved, including the mafia and the rich Arab monarchs, and of course the West. Is the other lesson in all of this, if you're prepared to kill tens of thousands of people, you can stay in power longer than if you're afraid to fire on your own people? I fear that it might be. Oh. You see, um, I mean, poor old Syrians, um, the minorities have always put their trust in the president because he protects minorities in a most cynical way. Because he's one. No, because he's an Alawite. He's part yeah, of the minority. Exactly. That's why. That's yeah. what I'm saying. He's won. The, oh, sorry, I thought you meant he's won the battle. He's sorry, no, there. no. Um, but you see, the problem in Syria is that um, the majority, as in all dictatorships, there is no institutionalized political institution practice. Uh, so you, you, half the opposition are shouting abuse at the other half of the opposition, including the Kurds. But I think the problem in Syria, you see, is that it had such a rooting in the Ba'ath Party, which was secular, nationalist, and Zionist, um, that it's very difficult to get rid of a foundation like that. It's a tough country, Syria. Ba'ath Party was always very tough, much so than the, what, the, the, the Democratic Party, quote unquote, in Egypt. Um, well, Gaddafi never had a party. He was a, you know, Gaddafi was always sort of, as Tom Freeman said of Saddam, he was half Don Corleone and half Donald Duck. Uh, I hate to quote Tom on that, but he did invent it. Um, and I think that you see, uh, remember the Syrians had for a long time were regarded by the Israelis as being people they wanted to keep in power, the, the Assads, because it was Assad who was going to sign a peace treaty, or Bashar. Allegedly. And, well, they got quite close to it mm -hmm. at one point. And so from the Israeli point of view, the last thing they want is an Islamist state or a chaos and anarchy on their border. They didn't like it when they had that with Lebanon. Or Egypt, for that matter. Uh, they made a big mistake with Egypt. I mean, when Netanyahu, he should have said, when Egypt had its revolution, Mabruk, congratulations. You can be a democracy like us if you want to be, but he didn't. He called up, uh, he called up, um, he called up uh, Obama and said, "Can you keep Mubarak in power?" Which is exactly what the Saudi king did. Mm -hmm. And when you have Netanyahu and the Saudi king both pleading for a dictator to stay in power in the Arab world, you can begin to understand Syria. It's a funny world. As you look, though, Libya, Egypt, Tunisia, Syria, mm -hmm. is there a thread that that? sort of binds all of these Arab awakenings there's, together? There, there's one thing which is quite remarkable, and people don't sort of spot it, and I'm not sure I spotted it very early on. People have generally stayed within their colonial frontiers. Egyptians didn't flock in their millions to help the Libyans overthrow Gaddafi. Jordanians haven't flocked to help the rebels in Syria. Uh, some Lebanese, but not many. By and large, the Arabs, who always talk about Umm al-Arabiya Wahda and one Arab nation and so on, or the mother of the Arab by and large, they've stayed within the borders which we Westerners gave them. They've stayed inside Jordan, they've stayed inside Egypt. This is extraordinary. I think the other thing which we don't recognize enough is that those Arab countries in the Arab awakening, which had trade unions, which worked, Egypt and Tunisia, didn't have the same bloodshed as those Arab countries where there were either no trade unions, Libya, or where the trade unions were part of the dictatorship institution, Syria, Yemen. So, in fact, what's interesting is that in 2006 and 2007, in a city called Mahala, north of Cairo, it's where the center of uh, the uh, cotton manufacturing industry is, very important for exports for Egypt, Egypt's economy, there were twice little revolutions in which the people in 2006, led by women, took over the central square of this town, which was actually called Tahrir Square, <laughs> Freedom Liberation Square, like in Cairo. And for two weeks, they held off the police and the Baltagi thugs of the Mubarak regime. They demanded Mubarak should go. He didn't, of course. But they won more money and better working conditions. And they were at the heart of the beginning of the industrial support for 
the January-February revolution in 2011 in the real big Tahrir Square in Cairo. They were the first people to come in with the cotton manufacturing trade unions. So I think that there's lots of PhDs to be written about the effect of trade unionism on the Arab awakening, the Arab revolution. Let me ask you about the Muslim Brotherhood and tell me whether you think that they are leading what has been taking place, taking advantage of what has been taking place, part of what is taking place? Uh, what what, what well, I didn't see leading members of the Muslim Brotherhood in Tahrir Square. Hmm. I did see them on television in Tahrir Square talking to Mubarak's elite goons. So, uh, first of all, they were frightened of this. It was, a, it was out of control. Hmm. These people didn't say, we want Islam. They said, we want to get rid of Mubarak down with the regime. Interestingly, and it's important to remember, they didn't, not one revolution ever showed a picture of uh, bin Laden or flew an Al-Qaeda flag. Bin Laden was a has-been when he was killed, murdered by the Americans. He was finished. And he was watching television. He would have seen he was finished. Not one young person found any kind of inspiration in Al-Qaeda. You heartened by that? I was at the time. I said after the Egyptian revolution that it was the happiest story I'd ever reported. It was. And I've reported some pretty grim ones and not a lot of happy ones. But I thought that a whole people rose up and spoke with one voice. And that's why, of course, to unify the people, you had to have very basic demands. Get rid of Mubarak, down with the regime. You couldn't start debating whether you wanted a Muslim Brotherhood government. The problem that we have, I think, with the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a historical party in Egypt, is that every time we hear the word Muslim, we see sort of um, kufir al-Qaeda people. And I said to an American colleague of mine the other day, who was asking a sort of similar question, I said, you know, most of the people in the Middle East, not all of them, but most of them, are Muslims. It's their land. It doesn't belong to us. They're not going to convert to Christianity or Judaism. They're Muslims. And, you know, we, in Europe, we have a Christian Democrat party in Italy. We have a Christian Democrat party in Germany. We don't assume they're going to start the 13th Crusade. No, but, but w nobody's lost any money inferring that when uh, Islamists get into power, Sharia law follows, and uh, a lot of the... Islamists got into power in Pakistan, and there was a certain amount of Sharia, and it's pretty much disappeared now. Hmm. Uh, the place where Sharia is most strictly followed is in our good friend Saudi Arabia, whom we love. And we remember, perhaps, that 15 of the 19 uh, hijackers who murdered more than 3,000 people in 9-11 came from Saudi Arabia. So we bombed Afghanistan. There's a problem there, but we can go into that some other time. So Saudi Arabia has been at the center of so many revolutions, the first one perhaps being the Prophet Muhammad. But you carry on. They supported the Taliban. They supported Osama bin Laden, who was a Saudi. I say to everybody, you know, we'll know there's an Arab revolution when we see it in Mecca and Medina and, and, and Riyadh and, and Dammam. Do you hope for that day? Got to watch what you hope for sometimes, right? Well, I don't hope for anything in the Middle East because I'm from a colonial country that was hoping lots of things of the various places we ran, including Egypt in the mm -hmm. past. You've got to remember one thing. We go back to democracy again. Britain said it wanted a democracy in Egypt under the king, King Farouk, who, of course, was overthrown. And... We encouraged the opposition in Egypt. And then the opposition came along and said, well, we want to get rid of the king. So we locked them up. Hmm. And when there was a revolution under Saad Zaghul in the 20s, famous Egyptian lawyer, we sent him off to Malta and the Seychelles, holiday resorts, sort of like Sharm el -Sheikh. And that's one reason why democracy did not develop in Egypt, because the people who were in opposition realized that if they actually said what they wanted, they wouldn't get it. They'd end up in prison, which they did under the Sadat and under Nasser and under Mubarak. Hmm. So that's why when you ask about democracy, I say, hold on. The word democracy doesn't have the same smell of perfume as it does, well, I'm not sure in Canada, but certainly in the West. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Let me take you from the Middle East to uh, more of Northern Africa. And mm. what we're seeing in Mali these days, what mm. we're seeing in Algeria these days, mm. I noted in the New York Times today, they said there were a couple of Canadians involved in the terrorism that took yeah, place I, in I, Algeria. Yeah, I that, yeah. I did. I, I haven't seen any names, but anyway. Well, they're probably not Canadian-born. If they were Canadian-born, they may not have been Canadian origin originally, originally, originally. Okay. I mean, who knows? But what do you, uh, I mean, as you look back at this sort of from a macro level, what do you make of what's happening there now? Look, first of all, Mali. Um, now, admit honestly to me, Steve, and I'll admit the answer to you. Four weeks ago, could you have told me what the capital of Mali was? Uh, we know uh, what it is now. It's Bamako. I'm but just to say I might not have been able to find it on a map for I'm you. I'm afraid the same would apply to yeah. me. Do you know the capital of Tajikistan? No, nor did I till I, I had to check in a few years ago. <laughs> it's Dushanbe. But the point is, you've got to remember that we have great ignorance about these countries. I don't mean 
the capitals, I mean actually the history. Mali has been a problem for three decades at least. And the problem in Mali is basically that the people in the north, Touaregs, Berbers, Arabophone people, don't want to be governed by a black government in the south. Hmm. Forget about Al-Qaeda. That comes on as a kind of veil over the top. But the problem with Mali is we think, well, we, the West, thinks we're going to fight terror in Mali. <coughs> Already we're getting reports from human rights groups that the Malian army, our new allies in this war on terror, are murdering Arabs in liberated towns because they say you've been cooperating with the independence parties in the north. So the French have got themselves involved. They think they're involved with Al-Qaeda. They're actually involved in a civil war. Algeria is a different kettle of fish. Algeria, which went through this ferocious war, million and a half, two million dead, with the French between 1954 and 1962. Algerians are very tough people, and the government now is not really democratic. It's a kind of military dictatorship. And the problem with Algeria for us is that they say we're at the forefront of the war on terror. 250,000 people died in their civil war between the government, the pouvoir, and the Islamists in the 1990s. And we think, oh, well, they've won the war. The West loves this. America loves it. Mr. Cameron goes along with it. But I was in that war. I saw how the army behaved. A lot of torture by the government. A lot of massacres by Islamists and government troops. And when the government troops decided to go against their enemies, they killed everybody. Innocent, guilty, they didn't care. As far as they were concerned, the innocent were collateral damage, which is what we say when innocent Afghans are killed by drones. In this case, the Algerians behaved as usual. They went for the terrorists, the Al-Qaeda people who'd taken over the gas installation, and 40 innocent hostages died. Collateral damage, they didn't care. I had an Algerian talking to me on the phone the day after it was clear that at least 21 hostages had been killed. He said, what do you mean there's a problem? He said, we killed the terrorists. I we had lots of people, innocent people, killed in our civil war. I noticed this is being portrayed <coughs> as a successful mission. Well, originally it wasn't, remember. Originally, uh, Cameron was embarrassed. He only heard that uh, it was taking place when he talked to the Algerian prime minister. We have the Japanese prime minister saying, please stop the raid. Hmm. They didn't realize the Algerians are tough nasty army. They, they go for their, they, they'll go for, for, for the throat. And they did. And afterwards, of course, it was impossible to start condemning the Algerians who had killed Al-Qaeda people. So you had to say, well, you know, the real responsible people were Al-Qaeda. Well, yes, but is it really necessary to have such a bloodbath of innocent hostages? No, it's not necessary. We have many cases where hostages have been got out of those situations alive, and the terrorists have been not only not killed, they've been brought to justice. And here we go back to the question of justice again. Mm. Uh, before the clock gets away from me, we have a few minutes left here, and I do want to play this clip. Because you <laughs> I know were, the clip. I know. You were here in this studio yep. in 1998. We mm. talked about the state of the Middle East back then. 9-11 mm. was still three years away. The invasion of Iraq, Afghanistan had not yet happened. And yet here were you in our studio, Mubarak and Gaddafi still in power, talking about events. Roll tape. There's going to be an explosion. This is the worst period in the Middle East I've known in 22 years. Mm. I bought a new flak jacket this year. And I don't do that unless I'm serious. Is the Middle East worse off now than when we last spoke 15 years ago? Um, I suspect we're better off. I mean, Al-Qaeda has played out. It, it does not have a popular role in Egypt, Jordan, Syria. Uh, there may be group of skills, but not more. We certainly had the explosion. I thought that explosion was going to happen in the Middle East. It happened in, as we know, New York, um, Pennsylvania, and Washington. But I think we all felt in the Middle East something bad was going to happen. We saw the absolute fury of the Arab Muslim people against the West for what they felt was an oppression against them. And a, uh, not just military, although that was sure enough, but uh, cultural, religious, you name it. And that hasn't necessarily got better. We, we haven't actually had an improvement. Um, but I think the real problems now, which were not so much then, Although it was then, then, is Palestine, Palestine, Palestine. The same Prime Minister, Netanyahu, as when I was talking mm. before. But um, I think that we're further away than ever from seeing a Palestinian state. It's I go to Israel and the West Bank. I don't think there's a room anymore. There's too many Jewish colonies um, in the West Bank for there practically, physically, to be a Palestinian state. So I put quotation marks around Palestine. Mm. But I always say, unless there is a Palestinian state, there will not be a real peace between the Arabs and Israel. And that apart from Iran, which is another kettle of fish for another time. Mm. Uh, that is something we're going to be watching over the coming year, it, two years, three it, years. It feels as if the whole Palestinian question is as far off the radar screen as it's been in 50 years. Does it feel that way to you? 
Well, no, it's been pushed off the radar screen by our endless lies about peace processes in Oslo, which didn't commit the Israelis or the Palestinians, but certainly not the Israelis to anything. Um, I think it was a charade. I think the Palestinians were taken for a ride. So were quite a lot of Israelis as well. I think we played with the idea that at the end of the day, the Israelis will get what they want and the Palestinians will shut up and get what, they, what we give them. And it hasn't turned out to be that way. And the Palestinians have started saying, look, we're not interested in a charade of a state, we want a real one. And they're not going to get one. And the Israelis have no intention of getting one. And they're going to go on building more and more colonies for Israelis and Israelis only How do you know on this? Arab land. How do you know this? Well, watch it. It's happening now. It's been happening for 30 years. Do you think it's going to stop under Netanyahu, who is about to win an election? But of course, when your programme goes out, we'll be able to say Fisk was right. He did win the election. It's going to be a more right-wing government than ever. And Netanyahu has said no one is going to stop us building settlements in Judea and Samaria, which is Israel's words for, for the, the West, West Bank. Bank. It's, it's going to happen. There's no point in saying, how do you know? It's a fact. And I drive around, I drive on the settler roads, I drive underneath the settler roads, I go into the colonies, the settlements, I talk to the but I'm Israelis. Inferring, there. I'm inferring from your comments that it sounds like you're not just saying they're going to build in, in the they outskirts and suburbs of Jerusalem. I, I, it sounds like you're saying they're going to go to Ramallah. They're oh, yes, going they're to going to go to the Jordan River. I think they don't have to annex the West Bank. They've got it. And there will not be a Palestine because there isn't enough room left for Palestine. Facts on the ground, eh? Well, no, the facts are both on the ground. The facts of the increasing colonies and the facts of no Palestinian state, and that is just as important. Hmm. Robert Fisk, I want to thank you for making... Uh, tell, uh, how, how long was it from the last time you were here? 15 years? 15 years. Don't wait 15 years to come back and visit us again, okay? How long are you going to have Mr. Stephen Harper here? Uh, you know, that has nothing to, <laughs> nothing to do with me and everything to no, do with No, but I want Canadians him to be are. here. I'm fascinated by Harper for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> There's the Middle East correspondent for The Independent, Robert Fisk, as always. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.